Book of Mormon Prophecy, a podcast series by Avraham Gileadi, Ph.D. 17. Types of a Secret Combination Do Book of Mormon examples of secret combinations typify an end-time secret combination that leads to the worldwide destruction that Isaiah predicts? Welcome to podcast number 17, Types of a Secret Combination. It seems that every generation where people grow in wickedness and they ripen in iniquity such that the dysfunctional patterns of the society are complete and the rising generation has little chance of recovering from it, that is the time when the Lord intervenes in the affairs of humanity and destroys that society. And we ourselves in this nation of America and around the world today the Western nations who have had Christianity, who have had the gospel of Jesus Christ in different situations, we ourselves are not exempt from this. In fact, the scriptures indicate that we ourselves will be overtaken by these same secret combinations that existed in ancient times that wiped out these ancient societies. And we're going to go to the Book of Mormon, which is the greatest asset we have in this day and age among our scriptures that indicate so many things that are going to be taking place in our day by direct prophecy and also by a series of types in the Book of Mormon and in other scriptures. And those types in themselves, they create patterns that are prophetic or indicate future events that where ancient prophecies were fulfilled, they also have, may have a second fulfillment. And this is what we're going to be discussing today as far as secret combinations are concerned. We're going to discuss some of the scriptures we've read before, but we read them again, we read scriptures several times over in the series of podcasts because we're discussing different situations, different contexts in which these scriptures apply. So here we go. We're going to go to Helaman, which is a great book for this type of thing. If you've read the book of Helaman and studied it and searched it, you'll see the similarities between what's happening in the Nephite society and the Lamanite society to events happening right here in America today. We're going to talk about a Nephite secret combination, Helaman 6.21. We know that these things are of the devil, Satan, and also all that is good comes of the Lord, and we have this juxtaposition always between these two forces pulling us one way or pulling us the other. Our fates, our destinies are tied to which we choose to be associated with, which we align ourselves with the Lord or with the devil. But we see here that it's, it just proved to be so easy for the Nephites to drift and other societies to drift from the one into the other as if there was no tomorrow. Satan did stir up the hearts of the more part of the Nephites, that is the majority, insomuch that they did unite with those bands of robbers and did enter into their covenants and their oaths that they would protect and preserve one another in whatsoever difficult circumstances they should be placed that they should not suffer for their murders and their plunderings and their stealings. Of course, if you've been keeping up with the news source of our nation and of around the world, you'll see that these things are happening today and have been increasing in very explicit instances. Unless you have had your eyes closed all this time, you surely must be aware of them. Of course, it depends on which news source you watch. As you know, nearly all of them are not interested in the truth of things, but interested in pushing their own agenda. We move on to Helaman 6, 38 and 39, Secret Combinations Seize the Government. And this is where this whole thing heads, as you know. You've already seen what's happening in this country, and you know that it's heading that direction. It's increasing toward that, and it's, it's going to happen. It's been predicted, it's been shown, it's very obvious in what's going on today. It says, it came to pass that the Nephites did build them up, that is, the secret combinations, and support them, beginning at the more wicked part of them, until they had overspread all the land of the Nephites, and had seduced the more part of the righteous, until they had come down to believe in their works, and partake of their spoils, and to join with them in their secret murders and combinations. Thus, they did obtain the sole management of the government. All right, so you see that? The seduction, there must be something really attractive about it, right? It's like taking care of everybody, but 
mainly your elite group that is taken care of. And as for the others, we just, uh, the people just simply take advantage of them, sue them, take away what they have, and thus they get more, or we get more if we're part of that. And eventually it becomes institutionalized in government. Moving on, we go to 2 Nephi chapter 10, verses 10 through 15. Attempts to set up a king in the land. And that is where this is also going. It's inevitable that the patterns are so consistent. You know that once this thing starts happening, it just continues there and doesn't let up. And they lose complete control by the secret combination of God's people and of the whole land. This land shall be a land of liberty unto the Gentiles. This is from Jacob. And there shall be no kings upon the land who shall raise up unto the Gentiles. This is the Lord's decree that this land, the Americas, shall have no kings or no dictators, you might say. And I will fortify this land against all other nations. And you've seen that, of course, in the great world wars, that no country has been able to conquer this land from us Gentiles inhabiting it at this time. And he that fighteth against Zion shall perish. For he that raises up a king against me shall perish. And there we have two parallel statements. He that fighteth against Zion shall perish. He that raises up a king against me shall perish. And the shall perish is a word link, linking these two phrases. But in other words, that any kingmen who rise in our generation are those who fight against Zion or fight against the Lord. And of course, they seek to overthrow the laws of the land as they did anciently. For I, the Lord, the King of Heaven, will be their King, and I will be a light unto them forever. Those that He's a light, He personifies light. Of course, all those who side with the Lord also begin to personify light, as they exemplify living His commandments. I shall be a light unto them forever that hear my words. Wherefore, for this cause, that my covenants may be fulfilled, which I have made unto the children of men, that I will do unto them while they are in the flesh. I must needs destroy the secret works of darkness and of murders and abominations. Wherefore, he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, male and female, shall perish, for they are they who are the whore of all the earth. So here we have the contrast of the Lord, who is a light unto those that hear his words, with the secret works of darkness, the one juxtaposed against the other, and the one leading to murders and abominations, and the lust of the flesh and all those things, and the other being a light and a savior and, and life-giving, not life-taking away. And all these, of course, are part of the whore of all the earth that the Lord destroys in the end. There is a redeeming factor in this whole situation because as evil increases, so good increases. Because the Lord doesn't allow evil to get above the heads of the righteous people who obey him. As long as they keep obeying his commandments, remaining loyal to the Lord, then he begins to empower them over the evil. As we read in 2 Nephi 10, verses 7 and 9, part of the same passage from Jacob, kings and queens of the Gentiles restored the house of Israel. And we've read this before in several contexts. And we read it here as part of this juxtaposed with the secret combination and cross referencing Isaiah 49, 22 and 23 that he is citing. It says, When the day cometh that they shall believe in me, that I am Christ, and I have covenanted with their fathers that they shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth unto the lands of their inheritance. So we have here belief in Christ, then they are restored in the flesh to the lands of their inheritance. So they're gathered and then they come and receive inheritance in the, the promised land. In that order, and it shall come to pass that they shall be gathered from their long dispersion, from the isles of the sea, from the four parts of the earth, and the nations of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, saith God, in carrying them forth to the lands of their inheritance. Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers. Wherefore, the promises of the Lord are great unto the Gentiles, for he hath spoken it, and who can dispute? Now, on the one hand, in the same passage from 2 Nephi 10, he's saying there's a secret combination that seeks to raise up a king in the land that is fighting against Zion, that has secret works of darkness, murders, and abominations. And on the other, he's saying, well, there are these kings and queens of the Gentiles who are you know, nursing fathers to the house of Israel. 
and are helping to bring forth its restoration and also to restore these people to lands of promise, lands of inheritance. Well, what's going on? How can he juxtapose these two things with one another? Well, it turns out that they are part of a great chiasm, a great series of parallel verses that have center point and so forth. It tells you that in this very time when these secret combinations are taking over the land and the kingmen show their face and so forth, and the government reverts to, to the secret combination and they take over the land, at that very time, these kings and queens of the Gentiles are performing their work of gathering Israel from the four directions of the earth. You know, that gives you a time frame also that it's at the very end when evil reaches its apex. That is when the good reaches its apex and these intercessors for God's people, these saviors of men, these saviors on Mount Zion, these servants of the Most High God, that is the time that they perform their great work upon the earth. At the end of that passage, it says, Great are the promises unto the Gentiles of the Lord. We have spoken it. Who can dispute? Well, of course, some are going to dispute. And there are those who have their own interests and their own agenda to fulfill, even among us, ourselves, as we read on, and they're going to dispute it. So these kings and queens of the Gentiles are going to have a hard time with with persecution from all sides, not just from the enemy, so to speak, but from within, the enemy without and within. In Mormon chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, we read about opposition to the house of Israel's restoration, those who dispute. He that shall breathe out wrath and strifes against the work of the Lord and against the covenant people of the Lord, who are of the house of Israel, and shall say, we will destroy the work of the Lord. Of course, the work of the Lord is the great and marvelous work of Israel's restoration. And the Lord will not remember his covenant which he has made unto the house of Israel. Oh, yes, he will. The same is in danger of being hewn down and cast into the fire, for the eternal purposes of the Lord shall roll on until all his promises shall be fulfilled. Search the prophecies of Isaiah. Now, when the Lord makes covenants, of course, he operates within the parameters of his covenants. And there's no way that he's not going to fulfill his covenants because he's God. So all those who have made covenants with the Lord to serve him, to do this, that, or the other, and he's made promises to, like those who operate under the terms of the Davidic covenant that we've discussed, these same kings and queens of the Gentiles, he's going to honor them as well. The covenants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the Sinai covenant, the Davidic covenant, and all those who operate under the Davidic covenant, whether anciently or in the end time, it's the same. The Lord will honor these covenants and fulfill them. Let me go to Isaiah and see the opposite side again, or those who work in the dark. Isaiah 29, 15, Pastor Herpin sings 2 Nephi 27, verse 27. Woe to those who contrive, that is a curse, a woe, who contrive to hide their schemes from Jehovah. They work in the dark thinking, who will see us, who will know? There we have that idea of the dark again compared to the light of God. And we go to Isaiah 52, verse 5, where we see the elites who are taking over God's people, the elites of society. My people are taken over without price. Those who govern them, that's their leaders, act presumptuously, says Jehovah, and my name is constantly abused all the day long. They're taking away these people's freedoms, and therefore they're captivating them. And gradually, of course, they do that, almost surreptitiously, so the people get used to it. And by then, when they're really used to it, they simply take them all over, as the ancient secret combinations did. Now we go to Isaiah 28, which is specifically addressed to Ephraim and its leaders. We're going to read verses 14 and 15. Because the Lord's people themselves are not exempt from this. You know that in the Book of Mormon, there were secret combinations among the leadership of the churches, even the high priests and doctors and lawyers. They made secret covenants, as we're going to be discussing as well in a moment. So Isaiah says, Therefore hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers who preside over these people in Jerusalem. Of course, Jerusalem is now a code name for the Lord's center of things in the end time. You have supposed by taking refuge in deception and hiding behind falsehoods, you have covenanted with death or reached an understanding with Sheol that should a flooding scourge sweep through the earth, it shall not reach you. We've made reference to this covenant of death and it's juxtaposed with the covenant of life in chapter 55 of Isaiah. So in the end, when the entire world polarized into two camps, 
even the leaders of God's people of Ephraim are involved in somehow with this. It doesn't say explicitly how, but of course, making a covenant with death is siding with the opposite side, thinking that you're going to you know, survive destructions that are coming and, and survive being singled out for persecution or whatever the idea may be, or survive being shut down or however the Lord chooses to respond to that. And then he goes on in verses 18 and 19 saying, Your covenant with death shall prove void. Your understanding with Sheol, that's hell, have no effect. When the flooding scourge sweeps through, you shall be overrun by it. As often as it sweeps through, you shall be seized by it. Morning after morning, it shall sweep through. By day and by night, it shall seize you. It shall cause terror merely to hear word of it. This is going to be a horrible result of the leaders choosing a wrong path. Then the consequences are this horrible, horrific scourge and water, a flood of water. Now, both of those things, the scourge and the water, are metaphors, and they are linked through word links and code names and keywords and so forth with the king of Assyria who personifies this scourge. He is the scourge, in other words, and he is the new flood that sweeps over the earth. That's a flood of fire this time that cleanses the earth of celestial beings. And we will be discussing that in other podcasts. Then he goes on to say in the same chapter, 28 of Isaiah, verses 21 and 23, for Jehovah will rise up as he did on Mount Pratsim and be stirred to anger as in the valley of Gibeon to perform his act, his unwanted act, and do his work, his bizarre work. Now you remember that part of the great marvelous work in the Book of Mormon that the Lord did, on the one hand, through the sons of Messiah, they called the conversion of the Lamanites a great and marvelous work. But on the other hand, you also know that there was a great and terrible destruction, a great and marvelous destruction among the Nephites, right before the coming of the Lord to the Nephites. And so the work of deliverance and destruction, as we see in these scriptures, is simultaneous. This is the destructive part of it, because when the Lord broke through on Mount Pratsim, that was in the Sinai wilderness, when fire destroyed those who were rebelling against the Lord or committing transgressions. And the same with the Valley of Gibeon. He was stirred to anger there because the army of Joshua fought against the Amalekites. The army of Joshua was fought in the strength of the Lord and killed the, uh, killed the Amalekites. The time stood still for them, and they killed them until they were pretty well decimated. It says to perform his act, his unwanted act. It's not something he wants to do. The Lord is not a vengeful God, but this is simply a consequence of people's wickedness, and he brings the covenant curses upon them to bear. And if he didn't do that, then he would not be a just God. These people are not about to repent of their actions. He says, and do his work, his bizarre work. It's part of the great and marvelous work of the end time is the destruction of the wicked. We saw that, of course, in Egypt, how Pharaoh's armies were destroyed and the Israelites escaped. There we have deliverance of Israelites from bondage in an exodus, and we have the destruction of the pursuing Egyptians, a classic type and shadow of deliverance and destruction. And he says to them, therefore scoff not, lest your bonds grow severe. That's the bonds of iniquity that are holding you bound. The more you rebel against me, the more severe those bonds become. For I've heard utter destruction decreed by Lord Jehovah of hosts upon the whole earth. Now, of course, as we've seen before, it is the apostasy of God's own people that sets this work of destruction in motion and also sets the restoration of the house of Israel in motion when the gospel turns from the Gentiles to the house of Israel. And now we're going to go to Isaiah 29 verses 20 and 21, cross-referencing 2 Nephi 27, 31, where people are being condemned on hearsay. And don't we see that in society today? Everybody's suing everybody. Everybody's accusing everybody. Just for fun almost, let's on the hearsay. If, if you have an agenda that, and they have an agenda that doesn't match yours, well, let's start accusing them and blaming them for this and, and so forth. And that's what's happening here. Tyrants shall come to naught and scorners cease. All who watch for iniquity shall be cut off. Those who at a word judge a man to be guilty who ensnare the defender at court. As I mentioned, simply excuse somebody and you're guilty unless you prove yourself innocent. Not the old system of justice. Then we go to Ether, where Moroni is speaking of attempts to overthrow the freedom of the world. Ether 8, verses 24 and 25. 
speaking to us Gentiles. Wherefore the Lord commandeth you, when you shall see these things come among you, that ye shall awake to a sense of your awful situation, because of the secret combination which shall be among you. Well, of course, there is a time of awakening. That word is a key word, and a word link. Who awakens? First of all, the Lord's servant awakens. The arm of the Lord is woken up. Then Zion is woken up, and we also see that the ten virgins wake up at some point. It's all part of a sudden realization in the end time. Hey, there's something going on, and we're going to be part of one side of it or the other. Or woe be unto it, let's do the secret combination, because of the blood of them who have been slain. For they cry from the dust for vengeance upon it, and also upon those who built it up. For it cometh to pass that whoso buildeth it up seeketh to overthrow the freedom of all lands, nations, and countries. So this is a worldwide event. This is a worldwide attempt to overthrow freedom. And, of course, these combinations, they have their friends, not just in one country, but they're, they're connected all through. And they're all part of this debauch and horrible performances and, and rituals that they do, which they think give them power over the righteous. The last one we're going to read is from Ether chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. The Gentiles must serve the God of this land. It's a warning again from Moroni to the Gentiles. He's speaking about a people's collective guilt. When enough people become part of this wickedness, then the Lord is going to intervene. But the Lord always makes provision for a righteous remnant of his people out of it. That is a possibility if we sufficiently repent. If we don't, we actually become part of the those who are going to be have to go somewhere else on this earth when the Lord comes and destroys the wicked. This cometh unto you, O ye Gentiles, that you may know the decrees of God, that ye may repent and not continue in your iniquities until the fullness come, that ye may not bring down the fullness of the wrath of God upon you, as the inhabitants of the land have hitherto done. As the Jaredites were wiped out because of their secret combinations, then the Nephites were also wiped out because of their secret combinations. This is the thing where God intervenes and makes an end. And so this is also coming upon us, the Gentiles or the peoples of the land of America, the lands of America, in fact, upon the whole world, but it's beginning among us, ourselves, as God's covenant people, as it always does and as it has always done in ancient times and as we read in the scriptures. Behold, this is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land who is Jesus Christ, who had been manifested by the things which we have written. You know that the end of the Nephite nation, and the Lamanites had pretty well wiped them out, Cumorah. They kept following after any Nephites left around, and on pain of death, they were asked to, to deny Christ. And if they did not deny Christ, they were promptly killed. So that we ended up with just Lamanites today, who are a mixture of Lamanites and also Nephites those who did deny the Christ, or who, in other ways, the Lord was able to deliver. In summary, that secret combination resembling those in the past will exist at Israel's restoration, at the time of Israel's restoration. There will be two concurrent events. This the secret combination holding sway in this land of America and in many other areas of the world, uh, seeking to dominate and taking away freedoms, and then we have the restoration of God's people of the house of Israel, the Jews, the ten tribes, and Lehi's descendants, or Lamanites of today, happening at the same time. And that's the time frame, the end, the end time when the secret combinations threaten God's people and all people in the world. And moving forward, do secret combinations exist today? Well, you have only need to look at the news, I think, and make a few inquiries, look, dig deeper, and they're very much entrenched. And I seem to have reached a point of no return. What is God's will for us to do in that case? Well, the answer is repent. And we need to examine ourselves what that means, what it means each of us, for each of us personally in our lives. Repent of what? You know, read the scriptures, study them, immerse yourself in them and the Spirit of God, and you'll see that there's plenty of things to repent of and to cleanse our lives of. And not only that, it means to return to God and to become God-like and to emulate 
Christ, that is what repenting means, to so emulate him that our lives become purified and sanctified as his life is purified and sanctified. So that we as latter these saints, as saints indeed, sanctified ones, may be among those whom he delivers and also empowers against the evil. Now the next time, at what point does God turn the tables on those who oppose his work? We'll discuss that. Excuse me. Recommended reading is End Time Prophecy, a Judeo-Mormon Analysis, which has a chapter on secret combinations. Thank you very much for listening. See you next time, and please share with others. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us today. Join us next time when we learn God's reversal of circumstances. What can Latter-day Saints learn from Isaiah's Covenant theology that informs us why and at what point God reverses His end-time people's circumstances?